Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, our Glengoyne tasting. Um, obviously, well, I should say welcome to Smoker, first of all. Um, so general um, normal housekeeping staff, just as people are coming in, if you can just let me know. Anthony, great, thank you. There's always people I can rely on. <laughs> uh, just let me know, yeah, the chat's working. Um, and then I will leave you guys here in the holding room while I just go and check um, our socials. Just make sure no one's lost um, and they can find us. If you, um, I know a few people are watching from the same household, but um, if you know anyone else or friends from a, a different network that might struggle, just just share the uh, the link as well uh, from where you're viewing from. Um, but other than that, I'll leave you guys here for a sec uh, and I'll be back in a couple of minutes. Hi, out. Yeah, I'll see you there. Cheers. Thanks. Cool, I'm back. Nice and quick today, actually, because I think with YouTube, it's a little bit easier to chase people up. It looks like uh, most people in. There's a couple still waiting on. Uh, hi, Tim. Cool. Uh, looking forward to it. Yeah, I am too, definitely. Uh, Glengoyne is definitely one uh, liquid not to be missed. Um, I think we're looking on... We need just a couple more we're waiting for. So I'll just run over the normal housekeeping stuff. Uh, usual if um, for any reason any of the guys drop off um, I will get them back in as quick as I can and uh, probably come in and fill some time um, if for any reason feed will drop um, touch wood we've not had that before but if it does just keep refreshing the YouTube page um, and obviously I'll get us back online as quick as possible um, but other than that it's, it's normal practice we've generally been pretty pretty lucky with our tastings um, there's what have we got ticket wise? Um, actually, anyone we've got at the moment to buy is the the Amroot tasting. That's our next one on the twenty fourth of July. So I'll post the link up um, for that at the end. Uh, and tickets obviously available. The obviously we've got the gin one on Sunday. So I know a few a few of you guys are on for that as well. Um, we did have. Um, I know I promised everyone a tasting. It's, it, it was going to be a fine spirits and cigar tasting. Um, which was looking to take place on the 17th. We've had a few issues now with the date on that. Um, we've actually got all the stock in, funnily enough. We've got everything ready to go. We just don't have a date. So we're going to sort of reschedule that, and then we'll release that as soon as we can. Um, and, yes, like I've mentioned to a few people, that you don't have to go for uh, the cigar option. That's going to be – there'll be a, a different ticket options for it, one without, one with um, – just for the, obviously any that doesn't smoke, which is which is fine. Um, and then we have a few more uh, gin tastings in the works that will be released over the coming weeks. Um, and we've got plenty more whiskey in the pipeline as well. So those will be up and coming. Um, I think everyone's on. So without further ado, what I'll do is I will introduce Jess um, and then we'll get going. We've got a special guest today um, in the form of Gordon, who is the international brand ambassador for Glen Goyne. So we're really happy to have him on. Uh, he's going to give us a plethora of information on, on Glen uh, while also tasting some great liquid. So let me uh, bring Jess on and we can uh, get things started. Hello, Jess. Hey, how you doing? Cool. Yeah, good. Uh, yeah. It looks all clear. Everyone's on. Yeah. So um, we've got, yeah, Adrian, a few comments coming as well. Yeah. yeah. And... Um, yeah, I will leave you to it and we will get going. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, it's probably not a lot that Shane hasn't already said. Um, obviously, tonight is all about Glen Goyne, the amazing whiskies of Glen Goyne. Um, and we've got four amazing, amazing uh, drams to try tonight, which really tell the story of Glen Goyne and its history. Um, and, and really give you an idea of what, what it's all about. Um, and, and as Shane said, we are joined today, um, very luckily, we are joined by the international brand ambassador, uh, who is uh, goes by the name of Gordon Dundas, and he's going to uh, 
uh, take us through these whiskies or take you through these whiskies, take me through the whiskies. And um, if you have any questions, comments, please, uh, you're always very active. So, so go ahead and make those answer the, ask the questions. And he's absolutely more than happy to to answer them. Um, we didn't send in out any chocolate out this time. Um, but if you do have any uh, dark chocolate that you want to try, I'm sure at some point um, there'll be definitely a space and room to, to try some with chocolate. So uh, let's see, let's see, let's bring on uh, Gordon and uh, introduce him to you all. Hello, Hi, hello, good evening. How are you? I'm very well, no, very well. Great to be here. Looking forward to a good evening of uh, some top drams and some good chat. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for joining us uh, on this Friday evening. Um, so, yeah, last time we met was obviously at the uh, Caledonian Club. That's right. Yeah, that was that was over a year ago. That was a that was a bit of a night. Um, yeah, that was a good night. I enjoyed that. That was a, a great event we did there. Great location. Glad to have you there. Thoroughly yeah, enjoyed it. You. Yeah. So, so Gordon and uh, well, so they put on uh, an event at the Caledonian Club where they tried lots of lots of the whiskies out of the range, and uh, Gordon talked talked us through them. I've got a picture somewhere I took on my phone, so I'll, I'll post it up at some point. But yeah, it was really—it was the first time I actually tried a lot of the Glen Goines outside of the, you know, the sort of the core range, if you like. Um, yeah. But, you know, really, yeah. really good tasting. Yeah, it was a great evening. And, you know, we've got, you know, I think it was, uh, you know, Glen Goines, such a unique whiskey uh, in terms of, I mean, there's so many things we can talk about, but for me, each time you drink a Glengoyne, you can get a different style, different side of that spirit, different side of that distillery coming through. So a fantastic, fantastic dram and very yeah. approachable, you know, as well. Really approachable whiskey. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the history of Glengoyne, um, you know, what it's about. Sure. sure. No. Well, I mean, you know, absolutely. Glengoyne, firstly, let's talk about the name. The name means Valley of the Wild Geese. So location wise, just north of Glasgow. Um, between Glasgow and Loch Lomond, effectively, right on the lower Highland line where it joins the lowland region. I'm not a big fan of regionality and whiskey in terms of style, in terms of location, yeah. Um, but certainly, uh, it, it, you know, right on that lowland and that border with the lowland. So actually, if you, when you drive up to the distillery from Glasgow, hmm. you're on the road, you park on the left-hand side. Uh, that's the lowlands, and you walk into the distillery on the right-hand side. So, uh, right on the border, does it make any difference to the whiskey? I could sit here and tell you it does, but it would be a lie. So I would, I would, it's not, <laughs> it doesn't. But it's a great story. So it's been there since 1833, and it's had many different owners over the past, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through. But uh, the Lang brothers, famously very famous whiskey merchants from Glasgow, mm -hmm. and then it was part of the Edrington Group up until. 2003 and when it was then purchased by Ian McLeod Distillers. So it's a it, it's a distillery which is a small distillery, not big, produces only about a million litres of alcohol a year compared to maybe something like the new Macallan, which is 14, 15 million. Yeah. So we are genuinely boutique. We are genuinely small and small batch and all those things you might want to say. Uh, we're, we're family owned. That really drives the agenda in terms of how we make our whiskey. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But being family owned, I think, is really, really exciting and interesting because the quality of the whiskey is the most important thing. So nothing, nothing, no corners are cut. Uh, as I as I describe it when you go there, Glengoyne is beautifully inefficient. You know, <laughs> we could probably from that set up at Glengoyne make 20% more liquid, yeah, 20% yeah. more new make spirit a year, but the whiskey would not taste the same in. 12, 15, 20 years time. It just would not have that fruitiness because of what you would need to do to the process. So so that's a real big point for us. And, and you know, the way that we are always, uh, we always talk about Glen Goyne is, you know, we're, we're a small, small player really. And we're really saying to people who enjoy whiskey, come and try this Glen, this different Glen, this, this Glen that's a little bit mm. different to maybe some others. And that's what, that's why I get excited about doing what I do internationally. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things that I think stands out is uh, some of the things that we are going to cover that make Glengoyne so special in terms of, you know, the, what you do and how you make it and and the uh, processes that are in place. But yeah. all of that really comes through in what I think is quite a luxurious, you know, whiskey in mouthfeel, in flavour. 
Um, and it all, it all comes, it's so authentic, isn't it, in, in, in its style? It is, and I think, I think that comes down to whiskey's made from two things. It's actually made from three things, but what makes great whiskey is great spirit yeah. and great maturation. Yeah. It's pretty simple. Um, doing that consistently is really important um and uh, ensuring that you you know things like you are consistently producing that fruity spirit you are consistently getting those great casks you're consistently maturing it in the same way and all those different factors feed into the feed into the narrative of of a whiskey mm. and glenn going over the years has continually delivered this uniquely fruity style um which we can talk a little bit about um but is very prevalent in 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 in, in a lot of our drunk whiskies all the way through Obviously, yeah. some whiskies you get a little bit more of that. Others you get a little bit more of the cask style. But you know, the key point is here. And every Glengoyne that I taste is Glengoyne. You taste it; it's there. So yeah. um, that's a really big thing for us. And and uh, you know, the guys at the distillery, we we're still a distillery with stillmen and mashmen and warehousemen. There's no operatives. There's no, you know, it, it's a you know, it's a great great family of people that work there um, yeah. from the, from the from the from the, the the production side to the visitor centers guides and obviously we have been closed for a few months which has been challenging but we will yeah. see where the guidance allows us to do in the coming weeks and months so is there is there no you're not operating at the moment you're not producing right now no we are producing we're not no visitors so glen oh, just to just to feed you into the dynamic glen Goyne has a lot of it has about 90,000 visitors a year, which is a lot for a small distillery. Mm. Um, and the experience that people get is fantastic. People love that experience. They love the, they love going there and it's proximity to Glasgow makes it very, very appealing. Um, but obviously that's something which we've not had from a, from a visitor center side of things, yeah. but we are producing um, and we are making whiskey, which is really important because it, you know, in 10, 12 years, time you will notice a hole if you're not producing for four or five months it's amazing how how uh you know that suddenly becomes an issue so it's yeah. great that we are and, and the guys are very happy to be producing amazing well look on that yeah. maybe, maybe uh i'm sure we have a lot of thirsty thirsty people so maybe we should try the first one and, and we'll chat some more yeah definitely definitely so yeah let's go for whiskey number one so whiskey so, number one is the the classic glengoyne 10 year old uh yeah. which i think tells you exactly what the story is about <laughs> slightly smaller bottle or you got bigger yeah, no, i'm not really big it's just a smaller <laughs> smaller bottle um yeah it's it's just a smaller selection so um i'm not i'm not yeah it's just the way it is so um uh yeah <laughs> it's the only one i have i seem to have sampled my other one so there's more than um, so yeah the, the 10 year old is a great for me, this is a great introduction to Glengoyne because this showcases the spirit style. It also showcases the sherry cask maturation, which we yeah. use throughout our range and throughout all of our whiskies. Every single whiskey we produce has an element of sherry cask, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. So this 10-year-old, 40%, very approachable. What I love about it, Jas, is it comes in a completely beautiful orange container, which means... Yes. Yep. But should you should you need to find it in an emergency, you will find it. You know, you know exactly where it is. It probably should glow in the dark as well, being that colour. Exactly. Uh, so um, no, it's it's a and that's that's the to represent the stills. But it's a really um, really uh, wonderful example of Glen Goyne. So I've talked about fruitiness. There is a greenness to this whiskey. There is a green note. There is green apples. There is that sort of almost gooseberry note, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that is Glengoyne. Glengoyne's spirit is pretty beyond belief because, um, you know, we, if I was to take you to 10 different distilleries um, and I was to, you know, and, and we took you to 10 different single malt distilleries in the Glengoyne helicopter, if there was a Glengoyne helicopter, <laughs> um, we all know that we use the same ingredients. We all know that we ferment. We all know that we, well, we mash, we ferment. We know that the distillation phase is the biggest influencer on spirit style. Forget using peat or not. Um, and I think what's what's really important here to understand is that from, from a Glen Goyne perspective, we're totally an unpeated whiskey. So yeah. the fruitiness of the spirit is really relevant. 
And so we produce that really fruity spirit by actually our still setup, of course, but also our fermentation and also how we how we mash as well. But the key point here is up is is the boiling point of alcohol, holding it at the boiling point of alcohol when we heat up those stills. Yeah. So yeah. that the so we get lots of copper reflux, which gives us this fruity new make spirit. Which is very apparent in this tenure. Yeah, totally. So, yeah, yeah. And it, so and it, I get this sort of green apples. I get a hint of the sherry cask. There's thirty percent first fill sherry casks in here. So okay. for a ten year old, that's that's incredible. Most ten year olds are bourbon or yeah, which is a lovely style of maturation as well. It's just this is a different style. It gives you a thicker taste at this at this yeah. age and strength. Almost slightly burnt as well. It's not not badly burnt. Do you know what I mean? Not not in a bad way. But yeah, yeah. That sherry influence is is definitely there. Yeah, it's definitely there. I get a hint of that sort of toffiness, maybe mm. a little bit of that sort of um, yeah, almost burnt sugar, but more sort of also a hint of sort of cinnamony. Yeah, yeah. In, in the background, um, but there's this green freshness as well. Which is apparent, yeah. Yeah, and so what I actually was was that multi the maltiness. Yeah. You know, yeah, the that, bar yeah. is like really talking. Yeah, the maltiness is definitely there. And, you know, that comes down to a whole range of different factors. But, you know, the point is, you know, we're all about it, – it's like it's like simmering our stills. It's simmering mm -hmm. them at the – we all have alcohol. The boiling point of alcohol, 78.3 degrees C. We hold it at 78.3 degrees C pretty much, maybe just in that area, certainly not much higher. We allow that those vapors to take a long time to go through the still. Some will fall back down. Uh, the heavier ones, the lighter ones, get to the top. They get over into the condenser, and we get those esters creating a beautiful banana pear apple yeah. flavors. And the ten-year-old yeah. has got all of it. Yeah, yeah. But if I was to, you know, say to somebody who'd never had a single malt before, what single malt would be a great one to give them as an approachable starter for ten? You know, yeah. this would be, of course, a great example. You know, there's others that people would say, of course, maybe something like Ben Morangi or a or a an Ochentoshin or something like that. But this has got really great flavors because of those sherry casks, which yeah, you know, it's not many whiskeys do at that age. No, no. Let's go for um, it. So it's a brilliant whiskey. So what what does everybody else think? I'm loving it. Yes, yeah, a, a lot of people are agreeing with the apples um yeah very smooth is the thing that people also get yeah i mean i think you know again you know glenn glenn Goyne is for me always it's a really odd thing to say but when you get a whiskey at 40 percent, you think it's obviously it wouldn't be a whiskey but you think it's probably 35 when you taste a whiskey at glenn Goyne, like we will do uh maybe at a different strength it seems to be less than it is and that is down to the spirit and great casks that is what happens when you get a whiskey that is very obviously the strength that it says on the bottle it can be the fact that the cask hasn't done enough and it's too spirity or actually sometimes the cask done too much and it'd be mm -hmm. too woody too spicy so yeah there's a whole range of factors but balancing those off is really really important to us so the 10 year old is is really important the other thing that I think it's really, really true here is, and, and again, comes down to how we make our whiskey. When you look at a bottle of Glengoy, the color you see is the color from the cask saloon. Yes, uh, it's important, yeah. yeah. So we're not adding any caramel. We are a, we don't need to, we would never want to. We want to showcase the, 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 the color from the casks and we invest a lot of money in sherry casks. So why would you want to add something to it? So that's very much our sort of ethos from Glengoy. Yeah, and, well, and the ten year old's uh, lovely. So is it? There's a little bit of bourbon, and then a little bit. Sorry, thirty percent sherry, and then seventy. Thirty percent sherry cask, first fill sherry cask. So we will use two types of oak for our sherry cask that come from Spain. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. We use European and American oak sherry casks. Now, of course, people have heard of American oak bourbon casks. Mm. Of course, American oak sherry casks, big part of the whiskey industry. Um, so that's that's oak imported into Spain. And goes through the from our perspective, the our sherry cask making process, yeah, uh, along yeah. with Spanish oak. So thirty percent, fifteen percent of each of those, um, and then we have what we seventy percent refill casks. So refill casks are casks that we have used before that we will refill, uh, and as a general, you'll get a bit less color than a first fill, 
you'll get a different ratio of cask v distillery flavors um and and so those refills you know you go around speaking to most distillery managers around the around the the land of scotland and, and even england and they'll say what's your favorite cask to mature and they'll go refills refills are the workhorse of the industry yeah. crucial yeah. to balancing off the power of first fill uh depending on what you wanted to create so yeah and it just allows it just allows the whiskey just to slowly develop as it gets to bottling time, doesn't it? Without without really adding so much flavour. Correct. And you know what you can, of course, do, and this happens a lot with, and it shows you you can, you know, oak, oak will only give so much. It, the first time it gives lots of colour, lots of flavour. Depending on how long you then mature it for, if you then use that cask again and mature it for the same amount of time, you'll get a very different whiskey to the first time you did. Um, you'll probably get less color. You'll get a different ratio of flavors from, uh, and, and also, you know, depending on angel share, oxygen effects, there's a whole load of things to consider. But, yeah, yeah. you know, single cast, we will probably use cast twice. Um, you know, an exceptional one, maybe use it a third time if it's still going to give color but uh, or flavor, but generally twice, mainly for the single malt industry. Then they'll go to, they'll be sold to blending or, you know, for, for, for people who are making blends, cheaper blends, because they really only need a receptacle for three yeah. years to hold the whiskey, you know, to yeah. make it legal because they're selling big volume. Yeah. So those are the sort of things which, uh, which are really, really important. So cast quality is at the center of what we do. Yeah. And, and you get your cast, well, the Spanish ones are from Jerez, right? Yeah, they are. So we, so we, yeah, we, we do use a hint of bourbon casks in our 12 year old. Um, but that's the only whiskey we use any bourbon cast. They come from obviously America, Kentucky. We'll get yeah. them from uh, the producers that everybody gets them from. Heaven Hill, Jack Daniels, all those types of things. Um, good, good point by Anthony. You will get a hint of raisins on this whiskey because of the uh, because of the sherry, the, the sort of European oak influence in there. But um, from our from our sherry casks, um, we. We, yeah, we, we get our sherry cast from Spain and it's a six year process to get them from from tree or or, or American oak log imported into Spain to a cask, mm -hmm. six years. We'll talk through that a little bit later. Yeah. Okay. But the 10 year old is a brilliant example of, a, of an introductory whiskey for me uh, that really is just saying, you know, you can drink this anytime, you can mix it, you can not mix it, you can share it, you can, it's a really beautiful, enjoyable whiskey, the 10 year old. Yeah, and it's really, yeah, really quite complex. Yeah, a lot of people are saying actually it's a great one for summer. Um, they're loving the sherry influence on the cask. Um, yeah, uh, the bottle won't last very long either. It's, and it is that, isn't it? It's just, it's just that it's got so much flavor, but at 40%, it makes it very, very drinkable without giving you, you know, and the fruitiness is there. Yeah. As a, as a sort of, I mean, as as a intro to whiskey, yeah, it kind of hit the mark. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know what you what you need to have in your cupboard at home is a whole range of different whiskies. I mean, you should have obviously have every single Glen going that's ever been released, but <laughs> you should have a range of whiskies that suit your mood, and and there'll be and we'll see that from what we go through tonight. But this is that whiskey that probably pans more of that mood than most because it's so you know, approachable. It's a, and it, you know, such a well-priced whiskey as well, but it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's a whiskey which will deliver in different, it's got a bit of richness that it can work after dinner. It's got a fruitiness uh, that makes it appealing to a wider audience. So it's very shareable. Um, yeah. And uh, it, you know, as I said, you can, you can mix it, you can do anything with it. it it's a really, really adaptable whiskey. It's, it's a great one to start off with. Great one to start off with. It's amazing. Love it. Um, and I think people obviously are our, our, our guys are loving it too. Um, Good, and they're loving you as well. <laughs> well, glad to hear that. Glad to hear that. Well, thanks, Al. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, you know, my point with whiskey is it's it's an occasion thing as well as. I mean, I get a lot of people say to me, "I've travelled the world and I've travelled the world with whiskey," and and you get people saying to me, "Oh, I remember a Glen going." 10 year old that I drank 15 years ago and and uh, I'm sure it was a different dram to what it is now and yeah, it may well have changed a little bit but yeah 
I mean, uh, not 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 necessarily for any worse or better. Just you know, they do change over time, particularly when you use natural color. Oh, I remember, you know, and, and and the key thing is, you're like, I bet you do, and I bet you that when you were drinking it, you were with friends. It was an occasion. It was everything that you you just remember that day. You remember mm -hmm. that that moment, and it's your whiskey moment. And um, so everything is amplified in your in your head because it was such an amazing time. Uh, and actually, maybe the whiskey hasn't actually changed. It's just it was such an amazing point in your life that all those fa factors feed into it. The friends, the occasion, the place, the celebration, the, the whiskey is a large part of it. Yeah, um, yeah. And uh, there's no doubt that, I mean, I, I, I look back at times when I, when I was – had a, two or three occasions like that. One particularly with a Val Blair thirty eight, but we'll leave that for uh, for for any further chat. And um, I, and I've tasted that Val Blair thirty eight since, and it doesn't quite taste as it, I mean, it's still a wonderful whiskey, but it doesn't quite taste as much as I remember it. Um, quite weird, but that that's that's what whiskey's about. We're selling a we're selling an experience far less yeah, just a yeah. little bit here. I totally do. I think I think you're absolutely right, and you know it's the same. People will. Remember the quality of the whiskey, or how good the whiskey was, based on all these other factors that haven't actually, you know, counted. Um, yeah. But the fact they remember the Glengoyne Ten is uh, is obviously a great thing. That many. There you go. No, thing. absolutely. And and you know, I I I, I think there's some great I call gateway introductory whiskies out there. This is one of them for sure. But um, you know, for a ten year old, it's got real bit of depth because of that sherry casks and. And you know, a lot of a lot of um, a lot of we, we see a lot of whiskies now in that sort of lower single malt price range between, you know, sort of thirty and thirty-five pounds, which is exactly where this whiskey sits. Mm. Um, and there's a there, there's a there's a there's some really cracking whiskies. Um, there's also quite a lot of um, you know things that are quite vanilla and quite um, which is fine. You know, they're bourbon. You get a lot of diversity, but um, you know, my point here is just adds that little bit of extra richness because of the fact we've committed to using in a 10 year old um, 30 percent first fill sherry casks, yeah. each of which costs over a thousand pounds. Yeah, which is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And that, that, so, really yeah. comes through. that really comes through. So, guys, that's the 10 year old. A really good introduction. Did everybody enjoy that? Seems they did. Yeah, I think a lot of people. Yeah, you've already converted people to Glen Goyne if they haven't tried it. Well, I'm very glad to hear that. Fantastic. And, and, and it's only going to get better because, you know, as I said, this is kind of the introduction to the story of Glen Goyne. Yeah, um, absolutely. We've not even covered anything yet, really. So that's great. So yeah. um, we are moving on to our second whiskey, which is the Legacy. So ah, this is a complete This, I believe. It actually says on the bottle 2019 yeah so this was one we tried last year at the caledonia that, is a, that was the launch event effectively yes. yeah yeah um yeah so this whiskey um is all about uh our history um it's all about people who've influenced glen Goyne through the whole range uh through the whole time that we've been there um and people who understand what glen Goyne is about um so the legacy series was brought in sort of mid, early, mid-2019, um, chapter one. There will be a chapter two. There will be a chapter three. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the key point about this whiskey is we wanted to change the dynamic because we've got such a, such a wonderful core range of 10, 12. Uh, there was a 15, which I know people uh, sometimes talk about. 15 has been withdrawn at the moment, but such is life. That's the way things go. 18, 21, 25, 30. We go all the way up in age. And what we actually wanted to do with the legacy was to create a wonderful whiskey by using, actually not using age, not using the confines of age, but actually to produce a whiskey that suited the legacy that we wanted to celebrate. So the, the one thing that we wanted to do very clearly was to, to produce whiskies for each chapter that were very different. Uh, and the other thing we wanted to do was to add in a little bit more alcohol strength. So 48% this whiskey comes in at. It's, um, 
It's dark in color. It, it's a no age statement, but you can tell this is not a young whiskey. This is not a whiskey that is uh, that is uh, you know six seven years old. It's older than that. The, the key point to this whiskey is that we're using forty percent first fill European oak Oloroso sherry. So those European oak flavors bring in those richer, darker fruit flavors mm. and, and put it more into the sort of 21, 25 taste area um, yeah. in terms of its uh, richness. So so those Europe, European oak will always deliver more color and deliver more richer, dark flavors because of the oak. So that's what comes in this whiskey. And the 48% makes it a little bit more, um, just makes it a little bit more almost vibrant, a little bit more richer on the taste. So uh, that's that's what this is about. So it celebrates a gentleman called Cochrane Cartwright, who um, who uh, he was a bit of character, but uh, he, he was a distillery manager in the late 1800s. And he um, was credited with understanding about, understanding sherry casks, understanding what they actually brought. Because if you look into casks in the history of scotch whiskey they were filling whiskey into any type of cask anything mm -hmm. they could any receptacle they could get really putting new made spirit in you know fish casks casks that held anything mm -hmm. and obviously laterally you know sherry casks there was a lot of sherry being drunk around the uk and this sherry would come from spain in these transportation casks which the scotch whiskey industry were going oh okay, we'll, we'll have that and they obviously were filling their thick their 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 spirit into it and, and realized it tasted a lot better. So yeah. that's sort of where the sherry cast story came from. But what's brilliant about this whiskey is it really highlights our sherry credentials. It really highlights our richer style that comes from those casts. So let's have a little try of it. Oh, so Cochrane. Wow. Yeah, it's it's just got a much darker, you can't really compare it to the 10 year old. It's such a different no, whiskey. It's yeah, just got yeah. a much darker fruit note. Yeah, totally. It's, it's as you say, it's like it's like you're drinking a whiskey that's much, much older. Yeah. It's got a, it, for me, it's got a, a lot more of that sort of syrupy style, a lot more of that sort of richer raisins and dark chocolate sort of nose. That's what you would expect from European yeah. oak when you drink it. There's a little bit of that tannic dryness. Um, there's also a hint of uh, a hint of that. There's also a hint of that Glengoyne spirit. You absolutely pick that up as well. Yeah. And then yeah. you get that richer, warmer sort of finish as well. Uh, it's just and, and that mouth coating sort of sweetness. It's such a great whiskey, um, and it's really celebrating Cochrane. So we want to thank him. He he. He unfortunately liked a bit of the old, uh, and uh, he came a cropper, unfortunately, in the uh, in the pond at the back of Glengoyne. Oh, uh, really? He fell in there, I think, drunken. Unfortunately, that was him. Uh, but he was uh, he was really important to our history, and, and uh, was uh, was part of the Langs, sort of when the Langs owned Glengoyne, and uh, you know, totally understood how important it was. So. Um, yeah, great, 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 great man, great whiskey, but uh, really important to, to Glen Goyne, and you know that's that's a major big thing. So, so yeah, because so, each I, I take it from this chapter one, and it's called the Legacy Series. So each yeah. of the chapters are going to reflect a different piece of Glen Goyne history. Yeah, the next one will celebrate another key individual in the in the history of Glen Goyne. It will be a whiskey that I'm sure is very different. Um, it'll be a whiskey that is. Um, you know, again, it'll be no age statement, but it'll be a very different style. Um, uh, very much aligned to to showcasing what 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 uh, you know that 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 person yeah. and the history. Yeah. And the history. So that's that's the whole point of the series, and it's going to be a limited run series. It might be, you know, three, four. We'll see. But um, it's a really really uh, great sort of because we've got a lot of age products in our in our range, and they're all wonderful. But actually, yeah. to have yeah. a story story led whiskey is really really good as well. So Peter Scott, um, I know you sort of answered it. How old is the legacy? I guess. I yeah, guess that's a good question, Peter. I mean, obviously everybody asks about age in whiskey if there's no number on the bottle. Um, I mean, the first thing to say, the color is phenomenal. So there is a, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, serious maturation in here. But I mean, you know, I would probably say an average age of around about ten years old. 
I mean, uh, you know, and what I mean by that, there may be some eight-year-old, there may be some 12-year-old, but of course, if if that was the case, it would be an eight-year-old. So, um, you know, an average age, probably about a 10-year-old. But, uh, really? but there's, a yeah, lot more, there's a lot more going on, isn't there? There's lot, there there's is a lot more going on. I think that's down to the cast. There's also, you know, it's, it's a different experience. You can't compare this to the 10-year-old. Yeah, it's yeah. a different experience. Um, and uh, I think the other thing is, of course, the the, 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 the heavier sherry casks are, are, are bringing that little bit more, um, bringing that little bit more uh, sort of, uh, well, I don't know, that's uh, well, mouthfeel, I think, is maybe the, the right yeah, answer. Yeah, exactly. it, it's also, sorry, Go carry on. on. No, no, I was going to say, you definitely notice, not not so much tanning, not, but it's a, for me, it's a little bit of a dryness there. That would be a bit of the tannins. European oak, as an oak type, has a lot more tannin in it. So if you were to compare American oak and European oak, American oak is a lot tighter. Right. has a lot more vanillin in it. Vanilla, that's what you get from American oak. European oak, much more tannin. So you get this very different style of maturation from a European oak. Mm. So when you use a bourbon cask, an ex-bourbon cask, it's it's – it's been charred violently on the inside for a minute uh, at high, high temperatures. It's gone into a bourbon warehouse for four to six years. It comes to Scotland. The bourbon, obviously, there'll be a little bit in the wood, but we fire in our spirit, and out comes those sweet vanilla notes, a bit of coconut sometimes, and you know sometimes citrus and all those types of flavors, which is great. Um, when you use American oak in sherry, you get a different experience because you, you, you're – you're, you're opening up the oak through toasting, not through charring. So that, that means you're opening up the oak more. But European oak opens up the most, and it really opens up. And out come, after you've toasted it, out come those compounds, those flavors that have been modified by the, by the sherry that's been in there beforehand. And yeah. that's why you get these raisins and dark chocolate notes. And, yeah. and they are, funnily enough, obviously, sherry-style notes. But actually, most of the time, you know, the key point is that's coming from the European oak. Right, right. Tim, Tim, Tim said um, he's added a touch of water to it, which I just did because he's done it. Yeah. He said he's got earthy dark fruits start to come yeah. out. Um, you will get a bit of that earthiness, yeah. So at 48%, a drop of water, you're putting in thin water into thick whiskey. Um and when you mature in sherry cask, you get a thicker experience in terms of the mouthfeel. This is non-chill filtered as well. Um, so anything above 46% in Scotch whiskey does not need to be chill filtered. Um, and so that gives you arguably a little bit more additional mouthfeel. I think it's pretty negligible with Glengoyne because there's so much. But um, it's, a, it's, a wonderful, um, it's a wonderful sort of, a wonderful sort of example of... Uh, of a younger sherry cask whiskey, and and I think that's what's great about this whiskey. It's it's a it's it's a great price as well for 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 something that's got so much sherry sherry influence, you know. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, I, I absolutely love the legacy. I have to say, it's it's something I, I had a I had a case of it about a year ago, and I think I've got about a bottle left. So uh, <laughs> I yeah, I, think, I actually can't remember it being as good as this that night when when we came to try it at the Caledonian. But no, it's it's amazing. Really, yeah, no, it is. It is, and it's 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 brought on by you know, as I said, that little bit of additional strength really adds to this, um, yeah. and the vibrancy of the first fill, the younger first fill, yeah. will add in some big flavors, and we'll see how that transpires a bit later. But uh, a great, great whiskey, the legacy. So, so yeah, that we we brought that in, as I said, about uh, a year ago, a bit more than a year ago, and it's absolutely flown worldwide, and you know. Um, some of the reviews have been superb for it. So I mean, you look, and people clearly loving it tonight. So yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Christmas pudding, Paddy says, absolutely. Yeah, That's yeah. the sort of style of European oak influenced whiskey. Christmas exactly. in a glass. Where's Where's the man in the red suit? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, really good. So tell us about um, about the obviously none of your whiskies are peated. None of them have peat. Um, no. So the water that you're using, mm -hmm. it, does it add a lot of? Does it add a lot of flavour? Because I mean, we've only tried two of the whiskies, but 
yeah. you know, what everyone is saying. There's so much flavour going on. There and, is. And as you I said, mean, for I, a 10 year old, even, even for a 10 year old, so much flavour. Is the real part of that that story? Well, I mean, I think I think the, the key point is I used to work for a very two very great peated whiskies. I'm a huge peated whiskey fan. Don't get me wrong. I and 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 as part of that cabinet that you have at home, if you you should have a peated whiskey for sure. Um, uh, now the key point about peated whiskies are when you nose a heavily peated whiskey, what's the first thing you smell? Peat smoke. Yeah. So, you know, that's great. Now, when they get, now, that, it, people love it. But Laphroaig 10, great whiskey, iconic worldwide whiskey, the main SKU for Laphroaig, and a great example of a slightly polarizing whiskey that is, some people like it, some people want to like it, some people just will never like it. Smokehead, our brand, very similar. Heavily peated, smoky whiskey, brilliant, but it's got this soft underside to it once you get past that sort of uh, position. So the point about peated whiskies are that they are they are known for one thing: peat smoke, whether it's heavy, light, light, medium, whatever, um, and that's almost the overriding factor. But what happens with these peated whiskies is if you mature them long term and um, you can really the smoke continues to drop off and you it really starts to reveal the the magicalness of the spirit now i was i used to work for bomore bomore is a one of my favorite whiskies mm -hmm. um and actually it says it actually was the first peated whiskey i ever had and glen goyne was one of the first whiskies i ever had so okay. um so I, I used to live next door to glen goyne so near enough um, so, so, so the key point is here, if you don't use peat in your spirit, you want to start on that fruity journey immediately, depending on what you're trying to create. At Glengoyne, we've always been a non-peated whiskey because of the fact that our, our proximity to Glasgow means that the geography was easier to get those fuels, you know, anthracite, et cetera, which, you, you know, to dry your barley. Um, but also there's no peat in the local area. So, you know, it, it's not a, it's just not a peated whiskey. There's no, if you look at a map of Scotland and you look at all the islands on the West coast, all of them are peated because that's what they used for years yeah, and yeah. years to, yeah. to produce their whiskey. But nowadays as a, as a, as a modern day whiskey producer, it's very easy to go to a malting house and say, can I have some peated whiskey? And in, ten, in, in three years, Time after you've used it, you've got effectively a peated whiskey if you want. Mm. So, 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 so the regionality is a little bit blurred now in terms of, you know, in terms of oh, all islas are peated. Well, most of them are, but actually not all of them are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, like Bukladi isn't. Yeah. Um, but uh, there's also some space sites that are peated. You know. Mm. Um, so you know that's my point about regionality, and you know, islas are always this. Well, now. It's probably one region that still is pretty true, but the lowlands are lighter. That's probably generally true, pretty much. You know, we, we, we just bought Rosebank Distillery. We're, we're redoing it. It's going to be triple distilled. That will promote that lighter style. Yeah. Um, highlands are always this sort of heathery, honey. Are they such a diverse region, you know, that can go from the very north of Scotland all the way down to Glen Goyne? Mm. There's such diversity in there that you can't yeah, say it's a specific style. Right. And space sides now have such diversity that I don't think there's a style for that anymore. But there used to be much more of a style because the regionality of whiskey was all about for blending. It was all about we need to have some space sides and some islands and some islas to and you used to use twenty or thirty different single malts. So so that's my sort of point. Peated whiskies are brilliant and they are great for a particular occasion. Uh, and uh, I certainly would always recommend people to continue to try them. But uh, I'm, a, you know, from us at Glen Goyne, and I can really only speak for Glen Goyne. It, we, we we never use it. We never have used it. We don't need to use peat. We've got such a wonderful whiskey as it is. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. I love it. Yeah, and and obviously our, our guests are loving it too. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. That's good to hear. 
But I think, I think, um, you know, I think from a perspective of something like the legacy, it's a, it's quite a, you can add a bit of water to that depending on how you're feeling. We also do a calf strength whiskey, which is uh, different batches. And, you know, what I love about um, whiskeys at that slightly higher strength, it puts you more in control of how water changes it. Water will change the 10-year-old for sure. Um, and I would always recommend to somebody who wants to put water in a 10-year-old at 40%, if you want to add water, add water, you know. Um, it's, it's, but, um, at something a little bit higher at 48%, a couple of drops, as we've seen, really changes that makeup and changes yeah. certain flavors get more amplified. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I'm really, so, yeah, I mean, it's a great whiskey. Oh, it's amazing. It's quite perfumed as well. But, yeah, it has, does have a hint of that. Yeah, no, absolutely. But a lot yeah. of, um, yeah, it's that pear and cinnamon that I'm kind of left yeah. It's almost like poached pears, poached pears in sort of, yeah. you know, that sort of richer pear, but really, really lovely style. Um, it's definitely moving on. So, you know, that, like you said, that sort of fresh apples that were in the tin, you know, are sort of now a little bit more stewed and cooked in, in, in yeah. the legacy. Yeah, and we're, you know, we'll see, we'll see a different, different way that works in the next whiskey. But, I mean, I think what's, what's, what's great is that, you know, as I said, even, even without age on a bottle, you know, once you taste something like that and the price point it's at, you're like, this is incredible. And it's one of those things that, you know, people go, oh, pff, I don't care, I love it, I'm going to buy it, you know, or I want yeah. it because it, it, it's just a great example of a of a of a of a sort of sherry cask whiskey at a at a great price point. So, so that's what we wanted to create with the batch one, and, and yeah, it's pretty much sold out around the world. So yeah, uh, so um, it's 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 great that it's gone down so well. So really, Amazing. really good. No, it's, it's certainly. Um... It's a good kickstart to this new chapter. Yeah. New series. So. Absolutely. I think the 18 sort of heads back to its core, the core range. Um, yeah, it does. Yeah. So maybe you could talk about the sort of this distilling process as yeah. your unique characters that really, you know, yeah. are playing coins yeah. about. Well, I mean, you know, we've talked a little bit about distilling. We've talked a little bit about how 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 we do it at Glengoyne. Um, the key point is here, as I said, is there's no cutting of corners at any point in the process. Um, and I think where that's really relevant is in the two main areas of, of making great whiskey. We've talked about the slow distillation. We've talked about the long, well, we haven't actually, but we've talked about the long um, spirit run that we get when we actually collect our spirit. You know, it's a long run because that that, that liquid comes out that spirit safe very slowly. Mm -hmm. So because we're not overheating it, so that's really really important to us, um, and it, it really shows you the function of uh, of how that affects your whiskey. Yeah. Um, and I remember speaking to distillers who who work in single malt distilleries that are mainly used in blending, and they will have particular targets to hit in terms of how much alcohol they need to produce and, and if they're behind it they'll crank those stills on they'll just yeah. heat them up and get that get that vapor through the get that vapor through the uh uh through the through the stills and the condensers um so it's a it's a really good uh, example of uh how we don't cut corners mm. but moving on to the 18 and how important that is the 18, we're now at a stage in maturation, taking into account what we just said, where we're really seeing a change, I think, and we see a very different style of uh, style of whiskey, uh, and you're going to taste that. So, 18, beautiful. So, so on the uh, on the tins, did you say the tins were the rep representing the stills, or no? The the, the orange of the ten year old represents the the cop is sort of coppery sort of. yeah and um, the others aren't representing the stills no um, but then, yeah. we're, no but the 18 fabulous fabulous dram so um this is i don't say this all the time but it is true this is my favorite language is it okay all right of our of our core range at the moment that might change and i have the ability to make that change whenever i want <laughs> but um this is the 18th so um what's brilliant about this is this epitomizes the word balance and equilibrium so the 18 i'm going to explain how it's made first 
50% first fill sherry casks for 18 years. So filled into those European oak sherry casks, those rich, darker flavors, filled into those American oak sherry casks, Oloroso sherry casks, um, those sort of stewed fruit flavors and vanillas and light cinnamony. And then 50% refill casks, 18 year old casks we've used before. And this whiskey has this ability to hit different parts of your palate with different flavors. I'm hearing some notes already on the nose, licorice, yeah. uh, cherry, uh, floral hints of lemon. I'll never forget the time I said to, to a guy, uh, I said, um, and it, it's a really funny story, but you pick up what you pick up in a whiskey. I uh, said to uh, a guy in a tasting, and he says, I'm really picking up strawberries in this whiskey. And I was like, Interesting. It's not what well, I'm not picking up strawberries at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, we actually had one of our blending teams sitting in the back of the tasting. And I was like, I'm not picking that up at all. I've never picked up strawberries in this particular whiskey. Um, and uh, John, who's, I think it was John, um, it, it, was in an, it was in an old tasting, uh, came down and said to me, uh, Oh, no, strawberries all over it. Yeah. Like, <laughs> really? <laughs> And I felt like I should have gone to the guy and said, look, you're right. It was up to you. But you know what you know in a whiskey. Yeah, a yeah. tasting note is one person's view. Yeah. Uh, it's like, these are very talented people who make a living out of making whiskeys, so they know aromas. But it's one person's view, and we all smell what we smell. Yeah. There's, yeah. No, there's no right or wrong way to do it. Um, but this is oh, – so this has, for me – Toffee, almost red apples, cooked red apples, stewed fruits, not dark fruits, stewed fruits. Cinnamon. Yeah. It has a maltiness. It, it's, like a, it's like an apple crumble type sort of thing going on here yeah. for me. It's that I'm sort of. Definitely that, getting, I'm definitely getting that toffee. Yeah, definitely. It's definitely just that it. absolutely amazing sort of balance that you get from this whiskey and it's, it's been absolutely crafted correctly in terms of the spirit interaction with the casks yeah um but it's got that fruity crumble note i once once was described by a friend of mine in a market he says he was a, he was austrian he went it's 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 an apple strudel oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and i know what he means i know what yeah. he means it's like a liquid apple strudel yeah it's totally, um, totally like that yeah and 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 that's what's really really brilliant about this whiskey because you get the dark side, you get the slightly lighter side, you get the Glen Goyne side. It all hits you around the palate. Yeah. You get, and the 43% for me, perfect strength for this whiskey. Yeah. It I just has so much going on. Yeah. I think, I think loving good, the 80. There's a good percentage to be at 43. Um, I just love it. I mean, you know, it would be a little bit different at 46 or something, but it doesn't need to be there. It's just so rewarding. When you drink it, you start to get that. It slips down, and then you get that cascade of sort of fruits and other things happening at the back of the mouth, and it's just just the most amazing whiskey. I absolutely yeah. love it. It's my favorite 18-year-old I think I've ever had, um, and I've had some great 18-year-olds, but it's just a wonderful, uh, wonderful aroma of of, uh, of, of Glen Goyne. And, and, and it's interesting when you get to that age, you know, you're now lost probably – 25% of the cask, maybe. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so the maturation has changed. So if you actually look at how a whiskey matures, color comes in the first six, seven yeah. years, much more than the next 10 years. Um, so, 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 so you, interaction happens at the front end. As you get mm. older, the cask doesn't keep giving on a linear scale. It, it draws back. It, and, and and as air gets in there, you get a different, you get a bit of oxidation going on, yeah. Yeah. and you get the whiskies change over time, and you get this almost polishing effect, which just gives you this, which just gives you this sort of absolutely wonderful example of of an eighteen year old that's been created the right way. Paddy has summed it up beautifully. Yeah, he totally has. Yeah, he Good absolutely man. has summed it up beautifully. That is exactly right for me. 10-year-old summer, legacy winter, uh, 18 autumn. He's absolutely right. Yeah. Totally it's got those, it, you know, 
it's got those fruits that, yeah, he's absolutely right. It's autumnal. It's an autumnal whiskey. Uh, and it's it's just that wonderful example of of maturation that has been done to the perfection. Um, and uh, the 18 year old has grown on me. I mean, I've been drinking it for a long time, but oh, it just it's just superb. And we had a very, you know, we had a, a I actually did a tasting with it the other day. We had a very famous 17 year old, which a lot of people talk about, and we we withdrew from the range because we were putting in more age. And again, people talk about the 17 year old in a very passionate way, and they're Oh, the 17-year-old. In 15 years' time, people will speak about this 18-year-old in the same way. Um, it's just a fabulous example of a whiskey of 18 years old. And there's some really good 18-year-old whiskeys out there. But yeah. I absolutely love this whiskey. And um, for me, it's just got that rewarding sort of sweetness, but it's got that real mouthfeel. It's got that I sometimes get sort of peaches. I'll get plums. I'll get cinnamon. I'll get almost nutmeg sometimes. I'll get... Yeah. A little hint of the rich side of the sherry casks, a bit of a hint of Glen Goyne coming through. Fabulous. Yeah. Oh, it's amazing. I've, I've just tried it again. And and that marzipan kind of really hit me. Yeah. At that time. No, absolutely. Uh, really, 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 really interesting, uh, interesting dram, the 18. And, and, you know, we then, if you look at the range, you've got the 10, the 12, um, the legacy. You've got summer, winter, autumn covered. And then you move into sort of 21s and 25s, and that's a bit more of the winters. They're more in the legacy area. Mm. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it sort of bridges the gap for me between uh, the sort of 12 and our richer, heavier sherry cask whiskies. This, this, is, this can be drunk. You know, it can almost be drunk as an aperitif or as a digestif. It, it's just yeah, got yeah. this wonderful richness that comes through. And, and but it's got a delicacy to it as well. It's not bold or brash. It's quite sort of delicate in a way. Yeah, it's just a, so elegant. Yeah, I agree with Michael. It changes the more you hold it on your palate. Yeah, the more it just opens up. It's fantastic. Really good. I actually don't. Remember, I don't remember it being that good. Mm. It so, is a fabulous drum. Absolutely fabulous, and something which I. Uh, you know, I'm uh, I'm I'm sort of you know pretty fond of, so I've got some bottles here. But uh, you know, again, I, I, you know, I, I took some round to to some friends for New Year, and we had a bottle of eighteen year old between a few of us after dinner. Yeah, perfect with cheese. Just think oh, of it, perfect, perfect with cheese, with grapes and oat cakes, and oh, fantastic! There was still a bit of chocolate pudding floating around, and everybody was okay. just that perfect time to. To deliver on that uh, on that style of whiskey that's almost multifaceted in terms of how it how it applies in the palate. Brilliant, yeah, absolutely yeah. superb. So Anthony's nice. enjoying it. Yeah, Anthony's loving it. Yeah, it's just got so much flavour. It's got so much depth. Like you said, it's got that perfect balance of being oh. something really fresh but also complex. And well, it's, I mean, it, it's an over complex balance. They're overused words in Scotch whiskey, and but what is true is when you. When you mature for longer, you get more complexity in a whiskey. Mm. That's the, that's what happens with age. So, so forget the color thing. It's not a tea bag. Whiskies don't act like a tea bag. They sort of get to a point where they get to, and, and that's it. Um, and there's a great display at Glen Goyne that actually shows you that when you go there. Um, but what does happen is you get complexity. Hmm. The spirit is changing as well over that period of time. So for 18 years, the way that spirit has gone in there and been in there for all that time, taking on those interactive elements that the added that the wood adds into a whiskey and also subtracts out as well. Um, and then the oxidation element as well that comes into it. My God, it just absolutely brings through a balance and complexity is a, probably the best way to describe this whiskey but as I said they're overused words in scotch but it, it really is a beautiful beautiful whiskey and, and it, you know it's a sherry sherry cask whiskey but it's not a bomb it's not a big rich sherry whiskey yeah great with chocolate yeah no look chocolate and whiskey is great and and you know if, if you were going to do a fully matured in European oak whiskey you'd look at 80 percent cocoa this is probably a bit more sort of 50% cocoa. You need a little bit of that cocoa. It's certainly not dairy milk. No. You need no. A, maybe Bourneville sort of chocolate for this. Um, Look at all day, you see. 
There you go. <laughs> exactly. So you know that's the that's the beauty of this uh, of, of this eighteen year old. It really is a really really great drama and my, my favorite of the moment. So yeah, and, you know. So so when we when we bought when we took over Glengoyne, where well, there was a ten, a seventeen, and a twenty one, um, and now. I mean, there's a 10, a 12, an 18, a 21. There's a cask strength. There's a legacy. Yeah, there's yeah. a 25. There's a 30. There's been a 35. So we've got a lot of different um, different SKUs, different drams that you can drink at Glengoyne. Um, and, uh, you know, they're all that. They all have their wonderful sort of features. And the 20, I mean, the 25 is a great dram for its rich sherry cask. But just to to... to to go back to why I love this, it's got this, it's got Glengoyne, it's got cask, it's got real, real balance between those two. Mm. And it's got this array of flavors that just comes out of the combination of those two, which is just fabulous. So absolutely loving it. Yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah, the 18 is, is right up there. But just to talk a little bit about sherry casks, they are so important to us all the way through what we do. Uh, every touch point of maturation, we use sherry casks, uh, and so understanding the, the how how they are made and that six year process that everything goes through is really really important. And so we we are in charge of everything. We are involved from the you know the from the uh, what type of cask, how much what age of sherry goes into those casks to season it, and it's really important to understand that the sherry's role is to get the wood ready to produce something like this. Mm. If we hadn't had that sherry in there for that seasoning period of two years um, or two and a bit years, that whiskey would not taste like that. You would still have great color, but it would be really strong and tannic and probably undrinkable. Yeah. So the role of the sherry does a little bit about what bourbon does for a bourbon cask. The bourbon takes on all that. If you look at the color of a four-year-old bourbon, it's darker than most 18-year-old scotches, you know? Um, and that's um, down to the fact it's sucking out all those color from that charred oak um, in that hot Kentucky weather in four years. Then that cast comes to Scotland. It's, it's got a hint of bourbon in the wood, but, you know, it, it, and it takes on those flavors and a slower maturation. The same with the sherry. The sherry goes in, it, it's, it's sucking in and out of that wood as well taking out some of the things which would just be too powerful for us in our uh, in our whiskey um and uh and it sets us up to produce something like that so it's a fabulous example what is interesting however is that we see more and more virgin oak casks being used in scotch whiskey uh, which is a cask that has had nothing in it before mainly bourbon style casks of casks that have been charred and not had any bourbon in them and you can, if you mature it correctly, use those for sure. Um, but European oak, virgin oak cask might be a little bit too much, too strong, too much influence. Yeah. But uh, it's a fabulous, fabulous whiskey this, as a result of those sherry casks. You don't do anything with virgin oak? We are, no, we, we, we try everything. So we, we did a live stream with Robbie recently uh, from the distillery, and he pulled out five or six samples, and he said they just weren't good enough. Okay. Um, and so we've got a very simple, simple, effectively a very simple maturation process. Mm. Everything we do is from zero to finish. We don't move whiskey from cask to cask. Right. We don't finish. The only whiskey, we, there's one whiskey we do in travel retail that we do finish. Okay. And we did it, and we did it perfectly because it won the best single bowl in travel retail. But, um, uh, we, we don't really finish whiskies. We just fully mature from start to finish and yeah. marry at the end. Okay. So those different cast types that you hear me talking about, 50% European oak or 30% mm. European oak, 20% American oak, that'll be 20% of those casts of that whiskey will be matured in American oak for 18 yeah. years. 30% will be in European oak for 18 years. And the 50% refills will be for 18 years or more and married together at the end. And how much, how much influence do you have over what happens with – the expressions. So I know you said when you, you know, when 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 you guys took over Glengoy and there was a certain range, obviously that's diversifying and changing. Do you, do you have a lot of influence over what happens? Me personally, yeah, not particularly. I mean, I think you know we've got the key point for us is we have limited stocks. We are not a whiskey which has um, which has 
huge amount of whiskey lying around. So we don't sell our whiskey in supermarkets. Hmm. We don't sell our whiskey in, you know, we don't sell a lot in travel retail. We don't sell a lot of whiskey in, you know, those sort of areas where a lot of other people who do sell them at lower price points. So we're very much driven by uh, understanding that, you know, we need as much of our whiskey to produce what we produce as it is at the moment. So where, where things do become a little bit interesting is things like the legacy, where we can come up with something that's a little bit different on a fairly small amount mm. and come up with a, a reason why we want to create this whiskey and why it would work really, really well. Um, so that's, uh, you know, I, I'm involved in that process for sure. Uh, okay. And I'm involved in, but, it, but we've got a, you know, we've got a great blending team that are, that, that know the stock levels and know what we need to, what they can, it, it, the worst thing you can do is create a whiskey, get everybody to love it, and then you can't make it anymore. Yeah. That's the worst type of thing to do. Yeah. So we're very much focused on on understanding that, um, you know, this is a long-term game. Whiskey is a long-term game. And, and you know, you, you've got to remember that you've got to have the right amount of wood coming in to replace what's gone out. Mm. You've got to, you, to, to, to be able you, for you to produce this 18-year-old as the same as it is now in 18 years' time. So yeah. that's what I think. Some people, I think, forget sometimes whiskey doesn't come out of a tap. <laughs> it really is a long-term yeah. investment, yeah. thinking about it, long-term inventory game. And that's yeah. where uh, you know that's where we saw the rise of NES. We saw the rise of no-age statements as a direct result of two things, if I'm honest. 20 years ago, the Scotch whiskey industry was selling whiskey on on me saying, you know, 20 years ago, I would, a salesman in Scotch whiskey, rightly or wrongly, probably wrongly, but would say the uh, the 18 is better, sorry, the 18 is better than the 20, tw than the 12, because it's older. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the whiskey industry was selling whiskey like that 20, 25 years ago. Um, that's not the case now. Uh, pe the consumer decides. Mm. I will say I will tell you why this 25 year old or this whiskey is very different or this whiskey is limited and more expensive. Um, but it's up to the consumer and the consumer is more savvy when it comes to these things these days. So the industry understands that. And, and you know, I did a tasting of Glen Goyne. Uh, uh, where was it? About six months ago in where was I? New York. And a guy came up to me at the end and he said, Do you know, I thought all the whiskeys were great. Really, really good. But the one that I'm going to go home and buy, and I'll probably buy a few of them, it's a 10-year-old. He says, you know, for me, they were great. But for me, that works for me because it is the it's whiskey price, worked for me taste-wise, what I want, perfect. Yeah. And I was like, that's great. I'm yeah. very happy you say that. Yeah. Um, so, so, so it's totally up to the individual. And I would never say that a particular whiskey is better than another one in our range. I can tell you the ones I like. I can give yeah. you the the facts and figures and the benefits of certain whiskies, but it's up to your taste. And, and that's what's really important. Well, I, I, th I think as uh, as we've sort of discovered in the range, also it's a sense of what, whatever is right at that particular time, you know? So it might be a, you're looking for something for pre-dinner or after dinner. It might be yeah. something that you feel you want to sit by a log fire, or it might be something, you know, you, know, you want to mix it. Whatever whiskey is going to suit the needs at that particular time. Totally and utterly right. There is no one fits all whiskey. That is true. And what makes Scotch whiskey so great? I mean, I used to work for Suntory, so I know Japanese whiskey. Mm. Um, great, great whiskeys, but you know, um, they learn from the Scots. They make they make it a different, slightly different way. It's the same, made the same way, but you know, there is none of it around at the moment, and it's way overpriced at the moment. That's fair enough. But what the success of Scotch and particularly single malt, but we also have to pay homage to blends. Blends have done a great job for, for Scotch whiskey around the world and still are, but um, is the diversity. There's 130 distilleries around Scotland um, producing 130 different spirits and yeah. then maturing them in maybe, you know, a lot of different ways and lots of different expressions, some doing peated, some doing non-peated, You've got such diversity in Scotch that um, it's such a wonderful example of, uh, and it's a very collaborative industry. The reason I love this industry, people, great people, yeah. great people. And yeah. 
and that's why we do it. You know, we're not, we're not, we are in competition, but we're very collaborative. Mm. So, yes, bring us on to our final. So, our final whiskey. What I'm going to do is, yeah, I think we'll just the first thing to do for the final whiskey is just to show the color of this. Look at that. Look at that. that so, a... on you go. Tell us what it is. So that is the the teapot dram from Glengoyne. The teapot dram. There you go. All oh, my lights in the way. There you go. Teapot now, dram. Of course, the first thing to say about this that is all natural color, which this is, is amazing. All... Carry on. I was going to say, it's just also, this is another example of age not being a factor. You know, in, totally in, not. And when you taste place. this whiskey, you'll understand why age is not important. So, look at the color of it. This is uh, the teapot dram. Let me tell you the story as you all pour your teapot dram. So, when you used to work in a distillery in Scotland in the 60s, 50s, you used to get something, it was a, there was a, there was a sort of What's the word? Uh, a practice called dramming. Now, dramming was. I mean, you look. You look back at it now, and you go, "Really?" So, dramming was a was a. Effectively, when you worked at a distillery, you would get a dram of sometimes new make spirit, depending on the distillery, or sometimes very young whiskey, and you'd get a decent dram. In the morning, you'd get one at lunchtime. You'd get one in the evening. Wow. Okay. Now, obviously, it was outlawed and outlawed in the seventies, but that was the uh, that was the whole point behind dramming. It was part of your contract. Now it was outlawed, but it, at Glengoyne, you always got whiskey at Glengoyne. Mm. You always got whiskey at Glengoyne, and uh, some of the young guys. So Duncan McNichol, who who retired in January, forty three years he was there at Glengoyne. Uh, he um, he was a young guy when this was going on. And he used to sort of go, I'm not really keen on doing this at 18 years old working in a distillery. So yeah. what, what what they did was they, they were told by the older guys who'd been working there for a while that oh, if you didn't if you don't want your, uh, your 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 dram, go and put it in the in the teapot in the canteen. So in the canteen there was this copper teapot. Okay. And this copper teapot sat on the side and all the young guys would just pop their whiskies in there and then obviously before a night shift, the older the older guys would go, right, you want some tea just to tuck into the tea. So all these different whiskies got mixed into uh, got mixed into the sort of uh, teapot. And it's it's a real celebration of dramming and what went on at Glengoyne. Mm. Uh, and uh, that's what's really wonderful about this whiskey in terms of it's a really beautiful story that goes behind it. And, you know, yeah. there's a great video online on the, on the YouTube, on the Glengoyne YouTube, that shows Duncan talking about dramming and uh, how this whiskey means so much to him. So that's great. So how do, how do we actually make this whiskey? Well, we use only first fill. We only use European oak as well. Okay. So um, you, as I've been saying all night, look at the color European oak drives into this. Now this is the this teapot dram is the oldest selection of whiskies we've ever used. Generally, they've been under ten years old. There's 14 plus year old whiskies in here. So this is the oldest selection we've ever, ever used. Um, and so this is 59.9%. It's cask strength. So these casks, most of these casks will be filled at 63.5% alcohol. So we haven't lost a lot of uh, strength. All first fill European oak. The first thing that's worth brilliant looking at this is look at how thick it is when you swill it around the glass. Yeah, look at that. You notice how thick it is. You just yeah. notice that thickness of this whiskey, um, and you're just like, that's incredible. Oh, now you nose it, and you're like, whoa, that's big. Yeah. You can almost but, see the treacle in the, in the glass before you even nose it. Yeah. But you go, yeah, that's big. It should be big. It's European oak. It's 59.9. It's going to be a bit prickly on the nose. Absolutely. Yeah. But get into it. You'll get into it in a minute. And you'll get into that. Your nose will get used to it. What I would do with this whiskey is just take a little sip, move it around the mouth. Your mouth will go, whoa, what's that? Yeah. Um, but the second time you drink it, give it a minute or two, you'll, you'll, you'll get a bit more flavor. 
Now, again, you can add water to a whiskey like this, but I would try it a few times before you do that. Mm. It's surprisingly smooth. It's so smooth. And this is my point about, I said it earlier, when you have high strength whiskies, you can reach for the water immediately and you're like, oh my God, I need to, you know, I need to reach for the water. It's very, or you get over it and you're like, that it is strong, but it's smooth. 59.9, it's intense. It's got real flavors coming from the, yeah. from the big, big, this is big cast driven flavors. This is, yeah. This is out of all the whiskies we've had tonight, much more percentage of of cask than Glengoyne. Let's just put that out there. This is a big sherry driven whiskey. It's not comparable to anything we've had before because it's at least twelve percent stronger than anything we've had before, if not nearly twenty percent stronger than the ten year old. So you cannot compare it. But this is a limited edition of three thousand nine hundred and thirty three bottles. It's a brilliant example and there are very few of them out there of a of a whiskey that is cask strength and only european oak sherry cask there's hardly any of them so it's a this is this is batch number seven double yep. seven uh the teapot's always been a the teapot has always been a classic for glengoyne it's very very sought after uh it's always and it's just such an amazing uh, the print already i've got through past that initial alcohol in the nose yeah. yeah i'm picking up now a real syrupy gloopy sort of raisins of course there's raisins of course there's a bit yeah. of that sort of just but i'm getting i'm getting licorice yeah licorice getting wet damp leather yeah um and i'm sitting here now thinking I'm sitting here now thinking, um, where would I drink this? When would I drink this whiskey? And this is that whole, I know when I want this. This is your late night dram that you want. And you've, you know, you just want to totally relax. Do you want yeah. to drink it in a glass yeah. like this? I wouldn't always drink a whiskey in a glass like this. So if I'm relaxing at home and I'm drinking an 18 and I know, I know the 18, I don't, I actually put it in a nice big rocks glass and just, okay, because I know it. Yeah. But this whiskey is so intense and so wonderful. You can't stop smelling it. No, you can't. So you're and just you like, know. you're permanently doing like this. So to enhance that yeah. on this whiskey, you're like, yeah, I'll put it in this kind of glass. And you know, um, you can't leave that another 10, 15 minutes and it's just going to like. Absolutely. Know. It will mellow out a little bit. The, the oxygen will get into it a little bit uh, and you'll get a very different experience with this whiskey yeah. when you leave it. A bit like when you would add water. And I certainly would find that if you're thinking I might want to add water now, if you left it for. 10 minutes you can come back to it you might think you might not need to add water but again it's totally up to the individuals but it's such a wonderful example of there's no whiskey like this and that just you know i've just been talking yeah. about just been talking about the diversity of scotch whiskey there's not many like this you no. could probably count them on one hand if there are even that someone's picking one out of them saltiness. sorry someone's picked out a bit of saltiness as well yeah, no, I don't. I, I don't particularly pick up a bit of that. Could be just saltiness is on the side of the tongue. I don't get it on the side of the tongue. I get a little bit of that prickliness, a little bit of that tannins, maybe a little bit of that alcohol. Oh, yeah, superb. Yeah, Michael says absolutely really superb. Good. And at fifty nine point nine, I'm going. Is it? If somebody said to me, "What? What strength is that?" I'd probably gone. What fifty? Yeah, you can tell. You can tell. No. Yeah, Michael said it any time. Absolutely, it's an absolutely fabulous whiskey. Um, and it's you know a, 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 a true limited edition, a true one of. And, and we've done six batches before this, and they've all been a variation on a theme. And this is where John, our blender, uh, and Emma can produce, uh, have the ability to look at casks and go, that is that is going to be great. Because what you've got to remember is every cask we use now, we don't use in the future. Okay. So if a cask is at its peak and it's really delivering some great flavors, yeah, it may still have a little bit more to go. 
but it's delivering some really beautiful versions of Glengoyne. You'd use it in a whiskey like this, obviously, if it was European oak uh, for this particular whiskey. So, 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 so their big challenge is to work out when a cask is right now to go into something like this or stay on uh, and become a, you know, stay on and become in the part of the 18 or part of something else that we do in the future. So, so there's a, you know, it's, it's, it's a difficult job being a blender and they do, you know, they, you know, it's why, you know, it's, um, we've got, John is, John is great. And he's, he's one of the, one of the, uh, one of the most, um, he's just, he just loves doing what he does and he just does it and he creates some amazing stuff. And, and, this is a prime example of that. Um, yeah. And the, the guys at the distillery team are involved as well um, because it's so part of the distillery. Um, yeah. And that's what I love. Everybody gets involved in it, and it, it's a really, really, uh, a really, really great story that, that backs it up. And it's, it's, uh, it's Glen going to the core of this whiskey, and it shows our sherry credentials. Yeah, totally. It's such a good whiskey. I'm, I'm going to try I, – I don't normally like to add water, but I'm trying try a little bit just to see what happens. Try it. Oh. I think it opens up some of those spices for me. Just a little Yeah, bit. it might get a little bit more. So what happens when you add water to whiskey? You may have a whiskey that sort of has a flavor profile, let's say, a bit like a graphic equalizer. It has sort of that sort of profile. When you add water, it may change a bit, you know, and yeah. different things will come up and different things will go down. That's what can happen when you add water to a whiskey. So actually when you speak to, uh, I remember speaking, to Dave, I used to work with Dave Broom, and when you speak to Dave Broom, he goes, well, when I'm tasting a whiskey, I will, uh, I'll try it at 40% and then, uh, or I'll try it, and I'll reduce it right down to, and take the alcohol out of it, okay. so that you can get some of the flavors coming through without the alcohol. So when you're judging whiskeys, for example, in a competition, generally that's what they will do, is they'll drink it maybe at cast strength or as it is, or they'll have They'll have two, they'll have one at high strength, one at low strength, and they'll be nosing them to see. Sometimes you pick up a an off note in a whiskey at a lower strength that you don't pick up at a higher strength. Yeah. And so that's the part of the process that John will go through to ensure that uh, the casks are all good that go into a whiskey. So yeah. he'll be looking at those casks and trying them at different strengths to ensure that that graphic equalizer of flavors are all great all the way through. I guess what's fascinating is how what they obviously have a vision, don't they? Like they have a vision of what they want to create, and therefore, what whiskies are going to work within that to create that that style. Definitely, absolutely true. And uh, you know, I think what's really important is that you have a you have a it, it comes down to it, it comes down to ambition. It comes down to what what is really important to us. We know that that story is so important to us. We wanted to celebrate it. How are we going to do it? Well, there would be no point in celebrating it with, with whiskey that was 25 years old. And it, it was always young. It was always vibrant whiskey. When you speak to Duncan, he said, you know, it was always powerful cast strength whiskey. Lots of sherry casts were in there because that's what Glen Goyne did. And that's why that was the profile that we used. Mm. What's John's challenge then is to create seven different that are on a theme. But just a little bit different. That if you did what I just said and add water to it and had them all, you would actually see the difference a little bit. Yeah, and that's what's really, really interesting. Yeah, uh, it's not. Anthony's just asked a good question. Is it Pedro Jimenez? We only use Oloroso sherry, so this is an Oloroso sherry cask. But it's the European oak that is giving the richness. That's what's really driving, and the a hint of the Oloroso. But the European oak is driving this big, rich flavour. Yeah. So no Pedro Jimenez. It's very chewy as well. You know, I find yeah, like it is. You just you find yourself actually physically chewing because it's. Uh, so yeah, no, I agree. And you also get this sort of. The other thing you notice with this whiskey, all the actions in the back of the mouth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah all exactly. this, all. Yeah. You know, European oak drives the sweetness further. It's almost like it's like dark chocolate. Yeah, yeah. As I said yeah. earlier, you would want eighty percent lint with this. If you eat, drink. If you eat 80% lint, the sweetness or the, 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 it all happens back here. Dairy milk's right here. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And yeah. that's a really big point. And it's all down to that European oak driving through the, uh, driving through the, uh, those rich sort of tannins and those rich raisins and 
licorice and leather and tobacco and That's all those perfect. sorts of flavors that you just pick up hints of sometimes. Yeah. It's been so, so good. Uh, yeah, great one to finish on. Fantastic. Yeah. Track. Oh, it's beautiful. I've never tried, I haven't tried it and I'm saving it for, for tonight. So I'm really glad. Well, but I'm you know, really glad you enjoy it. It's just that story between the 10 and then where you end up here and how it's still Glen Goyne and you can tell it's yeah. Glen Goyne, but they're all really different and, and how they evolve. Yeah. Very good. No, it's a fantastic whiskey. To, to, to have it here and taste it's fantastic. So uh, really, really great one and uh, really, really happy to. Uh, to, to talk about it, as you can tell, it's a great yeah, thing yeah. to drink on a Friday night. I'm really, really happy about that. We've so, been very, uh, no. very popular. P people have loved it. Uh, they loved, they've loved you. I think there was a couple of people that even asked if you were free on New Year's Eve to bring around the, <laughs> <laughs> your legs, the 18 year old round and get some of that dark chocolate and, and uh, cheese and everything else going on. Absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's almost, you know, whiskey, as I said, and I've said it a lot, it's, Set yourself up right for it. So, you know, I know when I would drink this. I know when I would, uh, I would, uh, I know when I would drink a peated whiskey. It's got a mo much more sort of outside element to me, peated whiskeys. Yeah. Um, I know when I want to drink sherry cask. I know when I want to drink a bourbon cask. I know when I want to drink a, you know, that sort of, I mean, I love a highball, for example. Yeah. When going 10 year old or 12, even 12 year old in a highball, superb. Yeah, superb. So you know that's the whole thing about whiskey, and you know, just see a a, a, a gentleman uh, never tried Glengoyne before, but we're placing an order for sure. So that, look, I mean, that's that's great for us because you know that means the quality of our whiskies are, are really shining through with somebody, which is fabulous. So it it it, it it's been it's been great, and the uh, what a whiskey to finish on. And thank you for thank you for coming to to speak to your to your guys. Really, really good. Appreciate it. I, I feel I feel like we're only halfway through. I, I feel we're like we haven't part two coming up at some point. <laughs> well, actually, we've got teapot one, two, three, four, five, and six to drink next. <laughs> but uh, no, I mean, look, there's it, we are just a small distillery who 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 are trying to do things in a really honest, open way. Mm. We will tell you about our cast. We will tell you about the the cast that go into whiskies. We'll tell you about the process we don't hide behind anything we don't hide behind natural color behind not natural color we, we we are a very open and and very approachable i would like to say um distillery people we want to engage with people and anybody who wants to know any more i'm on facebook they can get in touch with me um but uh, i've thoroughly enjoyed speaking to you tonight no uh, they've loved it I, th I think actually the teapot has been probably i think probably one of the winners tonight I did tell you I'm that. Not I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. <laughs> I'm not surprised, but I bet you if you I bet you you'll also you know the tens, people will remember the ten. The ten's a great whiskey. And you know, yeah, as I yeah. said, not many people after you get to the last whiskey in a tasting particularly remember the particularly remember the first one. But uh, don't forget the ten is that approachable overall whiskey. It's it's it's, it's it's a pleasure to work for this distillery in terms of the uh, the quality we're producing. Yeah. yeah, I think there's a lot of people have been, uh, as it's the first time for them, and they've, um, I think they've been very pleasantly surprised, which is good. Good. Yeah. I'm, I'm torn. Really... I, can't decide. I can't decide which one I like. Really? See, I, I think I'm, I'm definite for the teapot, but I agree. I oh, think, right. actually, if I was going for another one, then I think I would just go with the, the tent. Yeah. I think, that's, I think that's good. Well, yeah. you couldn't get two, you couldn't really get two Glengoins that are further <laughs> apart in terms yeah. of... <laughs> That's yeah. great, you know. That's that's the way whiskey is, and and you. Would but I think it's again, it's that it's that mood, it's that mood though. I think the teapot wouldn't be, you know, an everyday one for me. You know, it's when you like you said when you when you you, you chill and you relax down. Whereas like an everyday easy drinking when you come back from work kind of thing, and the Glengoyne Ten just works perfectly for that. Yeah, absolutely. Particularly in a summer uh, that. So I'm I'm really interested in who said that. Um, uh, as somebody said. Summer is the ten-year-old. Autumn is the eighteen-year-old. Legacy is winter. Uh, Teapot yeah. drum must be must be beyond the wall. Yeah, if yeah. You ever watch Game of Thrones. You know, it must be yeah, Arctic course. Circle. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, no. The legacy wins for me tonight. It's yeah, we've got good. Tim there. Yeah, Tim. Tim's a fan of the legacy. Yeah, no. The legacy. The legacy is like Teapot Dram light almost, but 
Yeah, it's I brilliant. Think. It's brilliant. Right. The teapot, yeah. the teapot dram will not be everybody's style of whiskey because it is quite a punchy, rich style, um, and uh, you know, really, really, really great um, example of a particular style. <laughs> it's not for everybody. Yeah, I, I have I have got to watch the race, Michael. I'm not I, luckily I'm not driving, but yeah, <laughs> my, my little O to Mercedes I'm wearing. <laughs> we got a comment there from Donna saying the next best tasting that she's had since our cocktail one, which was good. And actually, I oh, think it's a testament good. because me and Jas don't uh, don't stop raving about the uh, the tasting we went to with you there, Gordon. So I think it was yeah. bound to be another good tasting. To be fair, no, look, I'm glad everybody enjoyed it, um, and uh, it look, it makes these whiskies make it easy really it's a great story to talk about full of stories um and it's been a pleasure to talk to you gentlemen gordon and thank, everybody out there yeah no thank you so much thanks for entertaining us this evening um as you know our customers have loved it i definitely think we should be doing something again very soon with one of the other brands perhaps yeah um and really appreciate your time this evening thank you very much good to see you all take care enjoy the rest of the pouches or if you've not yeah. finished them all. yeah if they are, i think they're all gone yeah. i think they're all gone so yeah thank you thank you again gordon um yeah. thank you again to jess thank you to everyone as well for joining us as always um and like we always said there's 10 percent off any bottles that you purchased tonight so just drop us a dm and we'll get those ordered in for you um the next one we have up is the well there's a few people joining us on sunday for the the gin tasting um and then we have amroot uh, tickets available on that I will actually just post, um, I'll copy the link actually for the Amroot tasting and I'll post that in the comments, guys, if anyone hasn't got it. I think Who's a lot doing of the Amroot tasting? Already it's are. Ash Oaks doing it. Ash Oaks doing Ashok. it. Yeah. Uh, say hello to him from me. I will do. I will do. So Ash Oaks, people don't know, he's a global ambassador for, for Amroot. So, uh, yeah, he's very he's, well known. And he's a good friend of mine. I saw him the last time, I think I saw him, in Austin, in Texas, that just oh, really? shows you the madness of this. Oh, right. I'll, make, I'll make sure. I'll make sure I say hello. Yeah. Well, just, we'll send you a set. You can join in. in. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much. Good night. Yeah. Thanks, Thank you, everyone, guys. See you later. Thanks.